Okay, hi there, and welcome to an update video covering the characteristics and causes of globalization, a macroeconomics video. It's quite important to have a solid definition of globalization ready to use in an exam essay. This definition comes from the OECD and it captures the essence, I think, of what the process of globalization is all about. Globalization is a process of economic integration of different countries through growing freedom of movement across borders of goods, of services, of capital and people. If essentially, communities, countries being drawn deeper together and more interconnected uh, and helped, of course, by the spread of technology and global media. It's important to understand some of the key characteristics of globalization. Key characteristics. So what are the main features or characteristics of globalization? Uh, just reading through some of the top ones on the left-hand side there, an increase in the ratio of trade. So a lot of more countries are now more open. The value of exports and imports as a share of GDP is very high, sometimes above 100% for some countries. Increase in the flow of capital, financial capital across borders, both in terms of acquisition as well as foreign direct investment. The rise in the number of global brands, including many from emerging developing countries. Globalization associated with the, the creation of much deeper specialization of labor, so making specific component parts for a particular product. And that, that, gets, that gets morphed into, embedded into global supply chains. The idea, for example, that Apple's iPhone is sourced from nearly 50 different countries across six continents. We're seeing the emergence of new trade and investment routes, including the one that China is trying to build at the moment. Globalisation has also, of course, been associated with high levels of cross-border labour migration. And more generally, a much greater interconnectivity of people and businesses and communities through networks. Some key valuation points. First of all, globalisation is not an inevitable process. It's not inevitable. Some people are now talking about deglobalization. Secondly, some countries are far more globalized than others. So you have dynamic globalizers, countries like Malaysia and who knows, Vietnam increasingly globalized, Ethiopia and Rwanda and Africa becoming more globalized. Obviously, lots of countries inside the European Union. Other countries are more closed, less exposed to global trade and investment, sometimes by policy sometimes by, by virtue of geography. A third really key point in your revision is that the benefits of globalisation are not evenly spread. There's a skew in terms of who benefits, who gains fundamentally in the long term from globalisation. There's actually some evidence of, of the increased regionalisation in the world economy, increasing emphasis on regional trade agreements, for example, rather than overarching global trade deals. The fifth key point I want to really stress is that we live in a multipolar world. The idea that there's one centre of real economic dynamism and growth and uh, if you like charge is not long is no longer the case. There are many different parts of the world economy, some of whom growing quickly, others less so. There's there's no one unique uh, pole against which we can we can track globalisation. What are some of the main factors driving the process of globalization, deeper integration between countries. I've put here four, there's many more, but we're just worth highlighting four. Containerization is a, is a popular explanation from students. The cost of ocean and air shipping have come down due to containerization and bulk shipping and lots of other efficiencies. Essentially, the cost of transporting products across the world has come down. Technology is, of course, driving, technological advance is driving globalisation. It's cutting the cost of transmitting and communicating information. So the latest digital technology platforms, of course, are, are associated with a global world. We're seeing the rise of transnational activities. I'll say more about that in, in a second. But the poster charts of, of Apple and Google, tutor to you, etc. They're, they're the obvious poster charts for a global economy. And until recently, there were a lot more trade deals. The average level of import tariffs was falling, although there's some signs that's now reversing. Lots of ways you can track globalisation. 
trade against GDP ratios, the volume of or the value of foreign direct investment against a country's national income. You can track it by, for example, the number of overseas visitors around the world economy. This is a nice little measure. The number of Nike retail stores worldwide world, worldwide continues to grow. Now well over well over a thousand Nike stores across the globe. One point I really want to make and this I think is crucial to evaluation, is that we're now starting to see a big shift in the world economy. The centre of gravity in the world economy is moving, it's shifting. Uh, these are the 20 emerging market countries officially, as of 2018, including countries like Brazil and China, uh, India's in there, of course, and Nigeria, Mexico, Thailand and Turkey. Well, those of those 20 countries, businesses from those countries now account for 30% of the global Fortune 500 biggest companies in the world, compared to only 7% in 2005. We're now starting to see lots of transnational corporations from emerging developing countries. China Mobile, Alibaba, of course, the biggest global online retailer, the Amazon of China, the Tata Group, Indian conglomerate, which owns, for example, Jaguar Land Rover, Huawei Technologies, massive competitor now to to Samsung and Apple. Gili Motors from China, which bought Swedish firm Volvo in 2010. Infosys, one of the world's biggest information system businesses, well over, well, nearly a quarter of a million people it employs. So transnational corporations are really starting to emerge from the emerging parts of the world. And we're starting to see brands. These are the top 10 brands according to the brand directory for 2018 from China, from South Korea and from India. Alibaba's in there, Tencent, Huawei, Samsung, Kia Motors, Airtel, Infosys. I think it's really good for your exam to have just a handful of good examples of emerging transnational corporations and global brands from these emerging economies. They are challenging in many ways the hegemony, the power, market dominance of some of the of the well-established um, industrial conglomerates and brands from Western countries. And this is a really key chart for understanding globalization in 2019. If you look at the share of world GDP adjusted for purchasing power parity, um, according to the IMF in 2017, emerging market and developing countries accounted for just under 60% of world output. Advanced countries, just over 40%. European Union, 16%. So the, what, what, what's this chart showing? It's saying that the bulk of the world economy now is coming from emerging market developing countries. That will be the main catalyst, if you like, for growth and development going forward. But notice on the right-hand side that Sub-Saharan Africa, despite its relatively fast growth in recent years, Still, still only accounts for 3% of the world economy. There are threats to globalisation. Globalisation is not inevitable. What are some of those threats? Let me just pick out a few for you. Obviously, you'll be following, hopefully, ahead of the exam, the high-profile tariff wars and threats of tariffs between China and the United States. We will look to see how far that develops. There's also been quite a big increase in non-tariff barriers to, tra to trade, including quotas and other forms of, of uh, trade protectionism. Many countries now are moving towards managed exchange rates. Instead of allowing their country's currency to float in a world of increasing trade imbalances, a lot of countries now are thinking they can use the exchange rate as a lever of policy to try to achieve their macroeconomic objectives. We've also seen a decade's worth of high levels of debt. So we got through the global financial crisis, not unscathed, but we emerged from it. In the last 10 years, we've had essentially a decade of very low interest rates. And in many countries around the world, including in China, the United States and the UK, obviously countries like Greece and Italy as well, there is a much, much higher level of debt than there was in the previous cycle. Public sector debt, household debt, corporate debt. And that is a threat because in the past, big build-ups of debt and asset price inflation, that tends to come to an end and you're left with a big hangover. We've also seen a big backlash against the free flow of labour 
with calls obviously for much tighter controls of immigration, including in the UK. It influenced the Brexit vote. But I think more, even more important than all of these things, and debt and migration are significant issues, but we now face up to the threat of that's really significant systemic risk that comes from the environment, issues to do with energy security and water scarcity, loss of biodiversity. These are huge threats. They're also big opportunities for the global economy, but they are threats to the process of globalisation. Globalisation tends to break down during financial crises, and I think we're still living a decade on from the aftermath of that. And here's a lovely quote just to finish with from the IMF in 2016, which published a very detailed report on the costs and benefits of globalisation. And they said the following. Um, globalisation, driven by the mobility of people, capital and ideas, aided by information technology, brings opportunities for a better life for some, but dislocation and hardship to others. In other words, globalisation has consequences, uh, positive and negative, benefits and costs that are unevenly spread from country to country, within countries and across the world. These are the big challenges facing the world economy in 2019. Well, I hope this, this short video just gave you a little bit of an update on some of the key characteristics and key causes of globalisation. And we also touched on some of the threats to globalisation uh, going forward. Thank you.